So do we have any questions over the vitamins and minerals? Anything you guys want me to expound upon? Anything you guys want me to chat about? Everybody, of course, already watched the video, feels like they fully understand it, and they're just ready, rip-roaring for the final exam when they have to ask answer questions about it. Yeah, go for it, Cam. Okay, so I know you said, like, while writing the paper, you don't want us to, like, go through these articles and these studies and list, like, they did this, 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 and this, and this study, and it resulted in this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out like what the best way is to like discuss the information from the articles into like into the paper without just flat out saying this is what they did. This is how they've done it and so on. Okay. So in your paper, the goal for you guys is that you're going to effectively say in these five articles, they found this reoccurring theme. However, maybe this one or two article disagrees, or yes, these five articles find the same reoccurring theme, but this article found it worked a lot more effectively. This article found it didn't work as effectively. Okay, so you're wanting us to like look for specific themes from the papers. Yeah, you're comparing how they and you're contrasting. How they yeah, you're comparing, you're contrasting, you're trying to figure out you know, what's effectively going on that's similar between other people's work. So, you know, what okay. has been observed, what hasn't been absor observed, you know, you're trying okay. to, yes, it's not 10 individual summaries. It's synthesizing the research that they want to go. So uh, both Hannah and Blaine have actually already submitted their paper and they both, fantastic job. They really knocked it out of the park. In fact, my major advice for them, and this is something that all of you guys can use, which is make a table of all your references. So like name of the reference, and then like the next column would be, here's how many subjects they had. The next column would be like what their intervention was. And then the following column would be the effect. So let's say, for example, you're looking at the effects on creatine supplementation. And so like the first one is in power lifters. The second one is in bodybuilders. The third one is in baseball players. Then the next part would be like they looked at power output or reps to failure or batting average. And then the final would be, was there positive effect? Was there negative effect or was there no effect? But then you can actually see that kind of side by side comparison because we're looking for you to synthesize the information, not to give us 10 individual article summaries. If you give me that, I will give you a zero because that is just pain to read. Okay. If you're going to hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. Gotcha. So. But no, it's a good, it's a good question, Cam. So the thing that we're going to start off tonight, guys, is I'm going to have you guys get into some groups. And group one is going to be looking at magnesium. Group two is going to be looking at vitamin K. Group three is going to be looking at vitamin D. Group four is going to be looking at selenium. And group five is going to be looking at vitamin A. Ryan, you can use both individual sources and review articles feel free to use both of those. You just need to use 10 peer-reviewed references in your paper. So when we say different isoform, magnesium, there's magnesium oxide, which is what you find a lot of low-cost supplements, which effect effectively is a uh, potent laxative. It's not very bioavailable. Then there's magnesium glycinate. Three and eight is the one that in theory is really supposed to have more effects on your neurological processes. However, that research happens to be done mostly in rodents. And we've already had a nice conversation last week about how rats, though they're mammals like we are, or mice are mammals like we are, they definitely have some very, there's some differences in the physiology between the two. So, and then from there, kind of what are the differing effects? So like kind of what are all the effects on the body that magnesium has? What are all the effects on the body that vitamin K has? So on and so forth. Any questions before I send you guys into your first breakout rooms of the night? And then after that, we're going to talk about supplementation. Awesome. I'm going to give you guys, it's 6.06 right now, I'll give you guys six minutes. So at 6.12, we're going to come back and each of you guys are going to just paste into the chat the different isoforms, sources, and effects. And then if you want, we can even talk a little bit further from there. So let me get these breakout rooms made and
Yes, thank you, Courtney, for putting that in there for everybody. All right, guys, have fun, and I will see you guys back in six minutes. So obviously with a thorough breakdown of magnesium, vitamin K, vitamin D, selenium, and vitamin A, and a couple little additions I did. And the best part is I forgot to hit record through all that. So if you're listening at home, do your research on your own, because these guys did a really good job. And A, it's in your book. And B, examine.com is actually a really good source for a lot of this stuff too. Questions, comments, concerns before we start talking about supplements. Awesome. So honestly, I'm going to go pretty quick on this and we're going to hop to the end and I'll make this more of a kind of an open Q&A followed by we're going to have you guys work in some groups again, talk about some different supplements. So first and foremost, this is the icing on the cake after you've already had your full meal. So supplements can be useful if it's a way to fill in gaps, aka if you've got somebody that's a vegetarian, a vegan, so we're having a harder time getting enough iron in the diet, getting enough of some of the B vitamins potentially, we then want to make sure we're filling in those gaps. Or you just have an allergy. You can't do dairy and the way that you live your life, you don't get enough calcium. Okay, we want to supplement. Otherwise, we don't want to go with this. We preferably want to use just whole food. And so like anything else, you really just want to eat a varied diet so you're not having to do a lot of these supplements. And there's a good interview that there's up on the site uh, with myself and Andy Holmes through Informed Sport and Informed Choice. And he goes into a lot of crazy things about the non-regulation of nutritional supplements. And here's the thing, uh, the quality control and making sure that what matches what's on the labels in the body is pretty out to lunch quite frequently when it comes to nutritional supplements. What you're going to find is like anything else, what's on the label doesn't have to mix or match what's in the bottle. A lot of companies have been found doing protein spiking. So they're putting things in there that you don't even, you can't even break down and use as amino acids. And, but it essentially fills it up. Um, there's examples of fairy dusting. So they put, well, that's where you see proprietary blend on a label. That means they put in kind of effectively whatever they want. And you're not quite sure if you're getting an adequate amount of dosage on everything. And then my personal favorite is uh, off label. So they put things in there that even aren't, that aren't even on the label. Um, there's been some allegations, never fully proven, that some supplements, uh, specifically the first runs of them, will actually have oral anabolic agents in them, because it turns out those are really going to make you get a lot of results from the supplement. And then by the time the FDA goes to try to investigate them or otherwise, that first lot has been sold and been consumed. So the second lot no longer has that drug in it, but everyone remembers how much they got out of it the first time. And now they're on it and effectively hooked users. So caveat mTOR, you're going to, you know, pay, you're, you're going to get mostly what you pay for. So more expensive supplements tend to have better purity, but that's not always true. There's always people out there that are trying to make money and they're not doing it in very ethical ways. But I mean, you guys, it's not too hard to find a lot of places that are doing garbage stuff. So now, also, it's really important when we're looking at the effects of supplements, we keep a lot of things in mind. First and foremost is context. Was this for looking for actual increases in performance? Was this looking for increase in muscle mass? Was this really being applied in a way that actually matches for you? And the good news is a lot of supplement research is done on healthy, recreationally trained college aged individuals. So you're actually in the better age group for it. Uh, sorry, ladies, a lot of it was done mostly in men. So congratulations, you're kind of thrown out. So when we're looking at the population, is that appropriate for you? So yes, there's differences between men and women. There's also differences obviously between races and it's not all, and there's genetic components to some of these supplements. So keep in mind, like, is this population accurate? HMB is really good if you're old. And I mean like sixties, it doesn't really seem to have as much efficacy in younger folks. And training status is a big thing. Most research supplements are given to recreationally untrained people or recreationally trained people, meaning they mess around in the gym once or twice, maybe three times a week, or people that don't really train much at all. So it turns out supplements really work if you don't work out, you make a huge amount of progress in a short period of time. 
And what are we comparing it to? So is the supplement being compared to another supplement? Is the supplement being compared to something with the same amount of calories? Or is the supplement being compared to nothing? And if it can't beat nothing, my God, why are we taking it? And this is why when people talk about how great chocolate milk is, I immediately roll my eyes because a lot of the chocolate milk research is comparing chocolate milk to water. So if you're trying to look at what's going to help you recover faster, increasing your glycogen synthesis rates, protein recovery, or you know, protein synthesis rates, probably is going to be the thing that has calories. So something is better than nothing. And then randomization. So are we going through and we don't know who's getting what? Because obviously, if you know who's getting the supplement, you might try to motivate those folks a little bit harder than the people that are giving the placebo, as well as, you know, if the actual person thinks that they're taking the supplement. And some things are really, really hard to randomize. Because it turns out, you know, if you've taken a lot of caffeine, you're going to feel it. Same thing as things like beta alanine. Whereas, you know, other supplements, you're not going to really know if you took creatine until maybe you started gaining some water weight. A little bit later, but in the session, you're not going to be able to tell. Crossover design means does the same person serve as their own control? And this is great because you could always have a sampling situation where you're getting some folks that are really, really high responders and folks that don't really get much out of it on the other side. And congratulations. Now we see the contrast. And the big thing, guys, and this is why we're going to be looking at literature and we're looking at multiple studies, is with one study, we can find something significant with some relative frequency. If we have found 20, 30, 100, 1,000, 10,000, which if I remember correctly, at this point, there's over 10,000 peer-reviewed publications all showing that creatine works, it's pretty safe to say it works. But if it's only one or two studies, then, well, there's probably a reason because there's this thing called survivorship bias. And in, unfortunately, in the peer review, the things that get published are the things that have significance. So since you're basing this on what's known as frequentist statistics, the chance that something was significant, you're usually setting it at an alpha of 0.05, which means if any of you guys played Dungeons and Dragons growing up, it's got a one in 20 chance of coming out with effectively it being different, which you know is not very frequent, but it still happens. So there's a chance that the supplement looks better than nothing because of literally pure chance, not actually because it is better. So that's why you wanna see a lot of literature looking in the same direction. So. There is a lot of different supplements that are brought up in the text. There's even more out there to this day. Caffeine and creatine. Those are the two that really work and they're not that expensive. But with that being said, I hope you guys are ready for a lightning round because I'm going to go fast. Carnitine. Maybe helps a little bit with shipping fat into our mitochondria from the Cat1, Cat2 protein. Doesn't really seem to actually help increase performance, but cool, you can spend money on it. You're going to find it in different types of foods. Specifically, you're going to find it more in meat than anything else, but you're also going to find it in things like Monstar. Jai, I wanted to do this fast. Okay, I'll slow it down. Glycerol is a supplement you can use for hyperhydration. So this can actually be useful if you know you're going to have to go out and do really, really long runs in hot, in hot conditions. Adding glycerol to the actual water is in turn going to help you retain a greater amount of water going into it. Androstenodione is a form of prohormone that used to be legal. You could take that, it would convert into testosterone. Uh, Mark McGuire uh, was, this is one of the supplements that he was taking. Probably it wasn't the actual steroids he was taking. The steroids he was taking were probably way, way more powerful. 1AD and other prohormones are still out there that you can use. The key is don't. Because the problem with prohormones, guys, all the ones that really work, that really like converted easily into testosterone and then you know, gave you the effects of being on steroids, those were the first ones that legalized. So they were the ones with the greatest amount of positive effects on performance and the lowest amount of side effects. So after those got illegalized, you went down some and you got more side effects. And then those got illegalized and now you have ones that work kind of, but give you a lot of side effects. And now we're pretty much here ones that barely work and give you a huge amount of side effects. And yes, uh, guys, I'm always comfortable talking to you guys about the use of supplements and specifically, you know, drugs in from the experience that I have and friends that have had. Um, Andro wasn't really that powerful. 1AD, uh, Master Draw, Super Draw, those were like the initial pro-hormones that were banned in the early thousands. A number of my friends used them in the early 90s and they made some pretty darn good progress um, because it, it's, it's an anabolic agent. 
Uh, the problem with it is it's an oral anabolic. So when you take an oral anabolic, your liver has to break it down. And so it, it's taxing on the liver. And that's why people that use a lot of oral anabolics can have a lot of issues with liver health and liver function. So it's just not a very safe and healthy delivery mechanism if you're trying to utilize that type of supplementation. That's a great question. We're actually gonna finish on that, talking about that and having you guys look into it in groups. So bee pollen and specifically chrysin being a version of it, which in theory is slightly anti-estrogen, might help with overall health. There's nothing really there showing it's gonna be that useful. Beta alanine, which is the major limiter of creating more carnosine inside of your muscles, which is the uh, buffering agent, like remember like bicarbonate is inside of your bloodstream. If you can increase the amount of carnosine through supplementing beta alanine, the other is the amino acid histidine, which is rarely the rate limiter. You're going to effectively be able to do a little bit more anaerobic work. This could be useful if you're an athlete who works hard in the anaerobic glycolytic system. So if you know you've got to, you know, dominate between 15 seconds and two minutes, then this supplementation can be useful. You got to use relatively high dosages. I think we're talking about six grams or more a day. And unfortunately, one of the side effects can be paresthesia. That's going to be the uh, pins and needles on your face that you can feel from using too much of it at once. So dividing doses seems to be your best bet here. Uh, beta hydroxy, beta methyl butyrate, HMB, which is literally just a metabolite of leucine, and then alpha keto isocaprate. So you've probably seen KIC before in different supplements, and HICA would be another one. The, what's fascinating with this is it actually helps shut down the catabolic prof, uh, pathways inside of the muscle, which are much more rampant in older individuals. So it seems to be that if you are doing a better job, of effectively supplementing uh, with HMB. It, it seems to be more useful in very old individuals. Doesn't seem to be that really useful in the long term for individuals that are trying to obviously improve performance. Uh, boron, which is obviously a micromineral. In theory, if you're lower in, it could help with testosterone, but those research studies are usually with people who have low levels of boron in the first place. Caffeine, most, uh, the most heavily abused drug in the Western world. And for good reason, it, it freaking works. It's going to help improve endurance performance because it's going to help mobilize fatty acids. It's going to enhance maximal exercise because it's going to make it easier to recruit your muscles. It's going to help you with super maximal exercise. So really going beyond the Thunderdome if you've had one too many cups of, cups of Jaga. It's going to help speed you up. Dosage, we want to see about 0.3 milligrams per to six milligrams per kilogram of body mass. So that means someone that weighs about 110 pounds, we're talking about 150 to maybe 300 migs if we're really trying to ride the lightning. Whereas for someone that's about 200 pounds, now we're talking about somewhere in the neck of 200 and maybe 70 milligrams. If you, to the high end, we're talking about being up at like 540. And that's where you're gonna be ready to rip that off the line. When you go over those levels, that's where you're talking about, now you're getting all the jittery and everything else that doesn't help. And over about 30 milligrams per kilogram, it can be lethal. So it's pretty hard to kill yourself with coffee, but you could get yourself with caffeine pills if you're not smart. Uh, habitual users are gonna become desensitized. They have to use more and more caffeine. And there is a big component of good old genetics. Some folks are gonna to tolerate higher caffeine intakes better than other folks. You just got to figure out how you respond. Big key here can actually help increase carbohydrate absorption a little bit. There's a variety of mechanisms of action. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with the potential side effects that you can get. So uh, we talked about carnitine a little bit earlier. So the idea of trying to help get effectively those fats into our muscles doesn't really seem to have a whole lot of effects on enhancing performance, but it's relatively inexpensive and they usually throw in energy drinks. And you guys are probably drinking those anyways. Uh, choline, which is going to be important for making acetylcholine, the major uh, neurotransmitter of your skeletal muscle system. So this might be useful there, probably not. Uh, alpha glycerophosphocholine being useful there. Citocholine, which is another variation, seems to have a little bit more effects for its bioavailability on the, bioavailability on the brain and help uh, hopefully then in turn brain health. Chromium, specifically chromium picolinate, 
is going to be another micro mineral that if it's given can help a little bit with insulin sensitivity and then hence taking it up into the cells. Coenzyme Q10 is a fascinating one uh, in that it seems to have a positive effect on mitochondrial health. And there's like uh, PQQ10, which is uh, another variation of it and a good general overall, overall antioxidant, probably more useful for once again, older folks. Creatine really works. You guys know which energy system it's incorporated into. You could do the loading, which is you take a large amount over a short period of time. It's just gonna top off your creatine stores even faster. So in reality, save your money, just take it when you need it um, or take like three to five grams per day. Yes, it can cause some water weight gain, but if you're trying to get swole, hopefully that's the point. It obviously is gonna help with your shortest, most powerful energy systems. Doesn't really seem to have a positive effect on endurance exercise of anything increasing your water weight might actually lower your power to weight ratio and make you less efficient. And it doesn't really seem to have any issues on your health unless you happen to have some major issues with effectively uh, your kidney functioning, just like protein too much and you, you get yourself into trouble. Uh, your body can synthesize it your, itself. However, obviously supplementing makes it a lot easier to go ahead and increase the amount there along with you're going to find like with caffeine and pretty much every other supplement, there is very much so individual response variation. So some folks get a lot more out of it than others. So if you take creatine and you get nothing out of it, that's fine. That's just who you are. Move on, try something else. If you take creatine and you blow up and you make great progress, first make sure it's creatine. And then from there, it's a really inexpensive supplement to run. And there is even also some positive effects because it's taken up into the brain. Now, D-hydroepiandrosterone, uh, aka DHEA, is effectively, it's a precursor to testosterone. And it can help convert into your sex hormones. There's a little bit of research that it might be useful. Uh, the cheapest creatine you can find, Jay, creatine hydrochloride seems to have a little bit better bioavailability so that you don't arguably need to take as much. But creatine monohydrate is the most heavily researched one and the one that seems to work irregardless. And there's like, there's a magnesium there's a creatine bond, uh, I think, bonded to magnesium also out there um, that can work. It's just creatine is creatine is creatine. There's not really a big difference between the, uh, the version you're taking. So we've talked about fish oil before. So the big one being DHA and EPA, which are going to be important here when we're talking about our omega-3 fatty acids for when we're talking about DHA, more neurological system. We're talking about EPA, we're talking about inflammation. In theory, it's going to be better if it's in a phospholipid form because it's more bioavailability. So that's why you see things like krill oil. And there's even algae-based stuff that's like in the supplement brain armor. But it is going to be potentially a very useful thing, especially if you don't eat fish or you're not able to get a lot of omega-3 fatty acids in your diet. And I think this is one that's going to be fascinating to pay attention to as the science changes. So far, it seems if you have a higher intake of overall omega-3 fatty acids, you seem to have lower all-cause mortality. But you do need to take it consistently. Uh, ginseng is an adaptogen herb specifically more from, uh, there's actually some here and actually in Appalachia, you can get killed for it if you go into somebody's farm where they're growing it. But in reality, it's, uh, it's an herb which seems to have some effects on just kind of general overall health and neurological health. Um, there still needs to be a lot more research out here or out there to showing its effects and it's going to be relatively small. We just touched on glycerol earlier when it comes to hydration. Uh, inosine, well, actually inositol used to be a, one of the listed B vitamins, but then it was effectively removed. In theory, it might help a little bit with uh, relaxation, depending on how much of you're taking, and then also be important for a couple other uh, functions of the body, but usually people are gonna get enough inosine while they're eating just a relatively healthy balanced diet with a lot of you know, fruits, vegetables, and uh, nuts or meats in them. Now, lactate salts and polylactates is fascinating because that is going to be another carbohydrate we can deliver during exercise. So this can potentially help increase performance if you're doing something really long, like an Ironman or a marathon. But as far as supplementing with it otherwise, it's not probably going to have too much effect. It's just really hard to get people to supplement with lactate because they immediately think it's going to be the burn. But remember, that's not the thing here. Instead, this is just a fuel source that happens to be in your bloodstream. Now, uh, lecithin is typically a binder, so there's like soy lecithin and otherwise. This is one that actually seems to have positive effects on cholesterol, but eating a diet that happens to have higher amounts of fiber anyways, since you find lecithin in the plants, there's probably some correlation and causation to be wary of there. 
Now, medium chain triglycerides have been getting a lot of attention recently for giving people all this energy. And in reality, it doesn't really work out like that. The interesting thing about MCT oil is it doesn't have to actually go through into uh, through transporters into the cell. It can actually go through the membranes. So we don't have to worry about the CAT1, CAT2 system. And it doesn't really seem to increase energy production or our ability to really perform. It might get you to use fat a little bit more, but it's not going to give you all of this power and make you maybe run through walls. Uh, pangamic acid is actually what used to be vitamin B15. Um, it maybe has some positive effects on health, but yeah, this isn't really something you got to worry about. Phosphatidylserine is fascinating. It has some positive effects on brain function and actually helping uh, decrease cortisol production. This is one of those supplements that you can effectively, you know, buy and use as a powder. Uh, also, you can get it from taking in enough soy lecithin, which is kind of fascinating. Phosphorus, obviously, when we talk about ATP and just being a mineral for also our bones, it doesn't really seem to have the positive effects of supplementing with it, but I mean, cool if you want to. Just like when we're talking about pyruvate, obviously, when we're talking about energy production, the last component of uh, glucose, lactate supplementation is probably actually going to do more for you. Um, dihydroxy, acetone, and some of the ketone salts are going to be potential things that there's going to be more research on. And I think at some point it'll actually show it helps a little bit with aerobic performance, but it's not really going to be another thing worth investing in. Good old baking soda. And that was not an analogy to, caf or to cocaine. It does actually increase overall anaerobic performance. So things that are lasting from 15 minutes to two minutes. However, it's also a potent, potent laxative and given in big enough dosages also tends to cause people to, uh, to vomit. So you want to, if you're gonna try it, start off with a 0.1 uh, gram per kg of body mass and do that like the night before and dose with it easily doing the big 0.3 grams per kilogram, which is a massive amount of this stuff, guys. And that's a lot of sodium all at once. So it's going to be uncomfortable. Uh, it can help enhance anaerobic performance a little bit, but you got to be careful because um, you can have disaster pants from it. Sodium citrate, trying to be a lesser version of it, also working as a buffering agent, not as effective as bicarbonate, but you know, it's an option. Then you've got vanadium, which is another mineral, which seems to potentially have some issues with Right, issues but uses with insulin sensitivity and glucose metabolism in the body, there still needs to be uh, some more research on this area. Now, wheat germ oil was actually a really uh, fashionable supplement in the 50s and 60s. And now think about the idea of getting people to supplement with wheat as a ways to uh, enhance performance. It's just fat. It's not really that great. You're better off if you're going to supplement with fat, just go do fish oil. And if you're going to do fish, maybe just like have some salmon. Have some fish that you actually enjoy. Don't fry the fish first because you're pretty much undoing all the work you're doing. Let me throw that out there. So talked a little bit about the joys of contamination of nutri nutrient supplements and how there is a lot of issues out there. But now it's time to talk about some drugs. And we got a lot of options here. So I already know that Jai has some enthusiasm to go ahead and look up some information on the SARMs. So Jai's group, which is going to be Courtney, Sam, and Zach, congratulations. You guys are going to be looking at the effects of SARM usage. What is a selective androgen receptor mediator? What's a SARM? What's it do? What research is out there showing its efficacy? And so on. I'll help out where you guys need it. Uh, then Blaine, Emily, and iPhone, what would you guys like to look at from this list here? All right. Well, just because you seem to be interested in it, I want you to be looking at uh, peptides, specifically, Blaine, you guys are going to look at BPC-157 and TB-500. All right. Hannah and Ryan Carter, what are you guys in the mood for? Same thing, Jake Lewis and Nolan Spann, and then Abby, Cam, and uh, Josh. We'll take uh, CBD. 
Sounds good. Abby, camera, Josh, anything you're in the mood for? No, I, I don't know. It makes no difference to me, I don't suppose. Sounds good. You're going to look more into pro-hormones. Hannah and Ryan, if you guys don't have, no worries. So you're going to be looking at essentially what they are, what they do, the dosage, and the side effects. And since Hannah and Ryan are quiet, you know what? We're going to give you the race TAMs, families of nootropics. Any questions, comments, concerns before we send you guys back into your groups? All right, it's 6.45 now. Let's plan on 6.51. This time, or 6.52, I'll give you guys a little bit more. Make sure you have everything in there and that's what you paste in the chat. So it's not kind of a hodgepodge. So like, this is the race TAMs. There's pyrase TAM, anorase TAM, oxyrase TAM, phenyl pyrase TAM, uh, nephrorase TAM. They tend to do these things. Here are the dosages that you potentially use for them. Here are the potential side effects. And there's more research that needs to be done. So yeah, you'll be writing a novel, but have a good time with the guys. These are some of the more cutting edge dumb things that are kind of interesting. And then I'll talk on any other ones you guys want to talk about. So have a great one. See you guys back at 6.52. So yeah. It's okay. You did a pretty good job there. These are currently being uh, a, essentially uh, big pharma, so to speak. Pharmaceutical companies are doing a lot of research in this area to hopefully find and solve for ones that are going to be really efficacious, but uh, we're not quite there yet, guys. So great job. Great job. Now, the next slide is actually going to be some information from previous classes whenever it came to each of these supplements and specifically uh, alpha glycophosphocholine, alpha GPC is going to be in a uh, choline donor, which there's some research showing that it might help with performance, but it's not quite there yet. Uh, when it comes to um, methylfolate, uh, methylated folate is a specifically a modified version of folate, which is more bioavailable and specifically seems to do a better job with things like individuals that have got issues with uh, the MTHR or MTHFR disease, which is also known as the motherfucker. Literally, that's, that's literally what the acronym is called um, for it, which seems to have an effect with increasing energy availability and performance uh, when otherwise those folks wouldn't be able to take up as much. We talked about magnesium three and eight earlier, and then you guys obviously broke down a number of other ones in there. Um, yeah. Peptide 21 is one that's out there now for anti-aging and wrinkles. There's a, there's a lot of things out there in the peptide world. And I'm hopefully going to do an interview of a gentleman who actually does a lot of uh, research and work in that area. And if you want, I can get back to you guys on what kind of comes up there uh, with different peptides and their uses. And then you guys already talked about race TAMs and NMN along with NR, uh, nicotinamide uh, mononucleotide is in theory something that helps a little bit with mitochondrial functioning and NADH levels. And this is something that's currently being researched more, not just in lab animals, but humans for its ability to increase performance and uh, effectively uh, overall energetic uh, functioning. So not a lot of science behind it to show its efficacy, but boy, how do you get a lot of people that wanna stand up from the rooftop and yell about how great it is. Do we have any other questions about supplements for the evening? Speak now or forever hold your peace. And also just paste it in what you guys put in there, which you guys did a great job. So whoever's watching this at home can hit the pause button and look at whatever they need to so they can see. I had a question. 
I posted in the chat, but I don't know if yeah, you yeah, the deer through spray. Yeah, in theory, it increases IGF one. Uh, human growth hormone, just taking that's gonna be better off. We're just taking growth peptides. Um, yeah, the deer antler products don't really seem to have that much efficacy. Yeah. Turns out the things that really work are usually immediately illegalized, so they're a lot harder to get a hold of. It's okay. You play baseball. It's a sport that's known for the for the rampant drug abuse. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. It's okay. I, you guys got to keep in mind, it's double standards. We're in higher education. What's the drug of choice here? Adderall. Yeah. 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 There's the one that you need to get a prescription for. So that's white collar meth. Absolutely. But what's the, uh, what's the completely legal over the counter. We can all get as much of it as we want, uh, at pretty much any grocery store or gas station. Exactly. Abby caffeine. So we don't like athletes using chemicals that enhance the performance, but by God, if anyone forgets to refill the coffee maker, someone is going to die in the break room. So uh, we're going to touch a little bit on nutrition and training adaptations. Uh, this is going to be another one that we're not going to go too deeply into. But at the end of the day, guys, all this is a flow chart. This is thing A happens, which causes thing B, which causes thing C, which causes thing D. That's all it is. It's a flow chart. Don't overthink it. It is a flow chart. Okay. So when we train, we give ourselves the stimulus. The stimulus in turn is going to cause adaptation and event and eventually a response from our body. So obviously endurance training is going to give a number of different positive, some well, not necessarily negative, but really no effect in different areas of the body. Resistance training is going to do the same thing in certain areas of the body. So all it is, it's our body responding. So this right here is the two-factor model of training, which is a little bit beyond what we talked about in XFIS, which is where when we train hard, immediately afterwards, we increase our overall fitness. However, we also have a certain amount of fatigue we have to resolve. So if we think of this like glycogen, our glycogen levels are lower, though we are going to be increasing our capillaries and things that are enhancing performance. Now, fatigue abates faster than we lose that fitness we gain. Overall, that's going to net us an increase in performance. So all we're talking about is we have a stimulus, which gives us a response, okay? So if we're going to talk about training, the stretch on the muscle, calcium levels in the muscle, activated AMPK, et cetera, this in turn is going to cause our DNA to transcribe certain messenger RNA which in turn is going to translate into certain proteins. So we can start these signaling cascades from a variety of different ways. Uh, that's my little sister's nickname for me, uh, where this can be done by a major amount of stretch or tension on the muscle, high amounts of calcium, or changes in cellular energy balance. So for example, let's start with the flow chart on the right. It's going to be a little bit easier. We've got mechanical stress. It's going to cause calcium to effectively show up in the sarcoplasm. Higher levels of AMP because we've used energy. These are in turn going to activate kinase X, which is going to cause translation and transcription, which in turn is going to cause a change in amount of our gene expression, which gives us an adaptation. Now, let's actually talk about this, how it actually works in humans. So you're gonna go and lift weights. This is gonna cause activation of certain proteins. And notice here this flat, this uh, block here, that means inhibition. So this is TSC1, tumor sclerotic complex, uh, sorry, two, which in turn is going to help affect the activation of what's known as the mechanistic target of rapamycin complex one. This in turn is gonna activate P70SXK and for a BP1, that in turn is going to cause the translation and expression of proteins in our muscles to build more sarcomeres. The other side, I'm going to go for a nice long run. Now, we're going to activate AMPK because we've got lower cellular energy levels. We've got also high amounts of calcium, also activation of P30 MAPKs and sirtuins, which is going to all effectively activate what's known as PGC1 alpha. 
PGC1 alpha is actually going to go and literally affect our mitochondria, which in turn is going to increase our mitochondria number in our cells. All this is is a flow chart. We have our initial signal, okay? Then it's going to be translated into finally this expression, okay? This is going to take a certain amount of time. Typically, these signaling pathways are going to be resolved in 24, maybe 48 hours at best. So you're going to get this activation. Your body's going to make the changes that it can based upon, obviously, your fueling. And then, hopefully, getting you as close to your baseline as you were before. And then you can go and give your body another signal to essentially overcome. So we just talked about, effectively, PGC1-alpha and AMPK. Okay. So... We've got nutrients and we've got exercise, all of which we get the accumulation of AM, AMP. We're going to activate these proteins, which in turn is going to activate AMPK, which is going to cause it to break down more glucose, stop the building up of glycogen and the creation of new glycogen, get us to break down more fat, break down fatty acids, and once again, increase our mitochondrial number. But notice AMPK is going to inhibit the mechanistic target of rapamycin. And this is where we get what's known as the crossover effect. Meaning, if we're trying to lift a lot of weights, we want to activate mTOR to get bigger muscles. If we're trying to run a lot, we're naturally going to slow down our ability to gain a lot of muscle. This is why cross-country runners and bodybuilders don't look a lot alike. At the same time, yes, you're going to inhibit your gains a little bit from this resistance training, but we're still talking about you're going to make 70 plus percent of the progress you would have made otherwise. Now, when it comes to building muscle, we've got the insulin-like growth factor one and mechanical growth factor, which in turn is gonna activate the insulin receptor substrate one, phospholinositol three kinase into PDK one and AKT, uh, which also knows protein kinase B. All of these in turn are going to effectively influence what is going to hopefully be the complexing of the mechanistic target of rapamycin with Raptor, not Raptor, we don't like Raptor. And in turn, give us greater amount of protein translation. What also is going to occur is AKT is going to inhibit FOXO, so we stop protein breakdown, and GSK3 uh, beta, which in turn is going to inhibit the eukaryotic initiating factor 2B, and because of this, more protein translation. Okay, so one's a muscle growth pathway, the other happens to be a energy availability, energy production pathway. So let's talk about this time course. So that initial signal, we're talking that's seconds to minutes. Now the actual signaling cascade, now we're talking about getting into hours. And then finally, that transcription translation is gonna take days and the final protein synthesis, we're talking about all the way out to effectively 24 to 72 hours and this will be resolved. Now, why do we care about the end of this signaling, so the end of this actual protein synthesis, which is actually building us muscle or increasing our mitochondria, the signal is gone effectively after 72 hours. What does that tell us about training an athlete? Don't wait longer than 72 hours to train again. Absolutely, Josh, but get more granular. It's not just train again, but train what? <clears throat> whatever feels recovered because basically if you're not progressing, you're going to be regressing. So there's just an optimal uh, volume for everything. Yeah. So there is the, there is the stimulus dosage. So if you got a massive stimulus, it's going to take a little bit longer to resolve all this. But the other thing to keep in mind, it's in that individual muscle fiber. Okay. It's in that individual muscle. So if your goal is to be the biggest bodybuilder you can get, you need to be training every muscle group in your body at least twice per week, if not three times. Okay? Because after those three, four days, your quads aren't getting any bigger. Your lats aren't getting any bigger. You've got to go and give yourself another signal to overcome if you're trying to make the fastest progress you can make. But that is a good point you bring up there, Josh, where you need to make sure that you're making progress and you're not just burying yourself underneath all the volume. Now, 
What we can definitely tell you is giving yourself, obviously, a greater amount of carbohydrates, you're going to be able to recover faster. However, if you can adapt your body to working with lower amounts of carbohydrates, whenever you're looking at power to fatigue, so we're looking at exhaustion, so how long can you make it? People that train with lower carbohydrates actually are going to do a better job in increasing their mitochondrial number. And because of that, because of greater reliance on fat, they're actually going to be able to perform a little bit further. Now, mind you, this is how long you last. Most sports are about who finishes first. So it's not who's out there for the longest, it's who got it done in the shortest period of time. So keep that in mind, okay? So you can actually see the increases in citrate synthase and HAD compared from the low carb group to the high carb group. Now, when it comes to nutrition effects on training, Training without breakfast isn't really necessarily going to help increase your performance that much. It might have a little bit of effect, but it's not going to be that big a one. Taking in carbs, once again, is going to allow you to train at a higher intensity, which is probably going to be more useful for you tactically. But if your goal is to just become a better aerobic athlete, having periods of time where you're not dosing with carbohydrates can be useful. Leucine is important for helping increase the activation of the mechanistic target of rapamycin. Remember, guys, to our building a house analogy, if we don't have enough bricks and mortar, who cares effectively about the fact that we've got a whole lot of nails? We still need everything else. Using excessive antioxidants don't allow us to create as many reactive oxidative species, which in turn is not going to allow our body to respond effectively and increase or essentially have as great of a response to training. And same thing about taking NSAIDs. If you're taking them actually consistently, it decreases the amount of progress that you would otherwise make on your training. Now, VEGF is a signaler for increasing our amount of capillarization and in turn, which is going to help increase our overall energy turnover and oxidation ability. So when we're looking at different types of signaling factors, we do need to keep in mind that if we're applying a stimulus, our body is going to respond to the best of its ability. We need to apply a big enough stimulus that we're going to be disrupting that homeostasis, allostasis, so we in turn are going to be getting the body to make the changes we're looking for. Now, obviously, overtraining does exist. This is where we are applying too much stress at, before the body can fully recover. And because of this, we can risk long-term catastrophic injuries, so we're never going to get to the same level anymore. We have to listen to our body. We have to give it time to recover. So keep in mind, when you're working with anyone, yourself or otherwise, yeah, you're going to be pretty sore after your training. That's completely normal. But you have to give yourself time to where you've made progress, and now you can train hard again. And then you've made progress again, and you can train hard and keep going and going. Now, there's periods of time where you're going to overreach, and you're going to have slightly lower recoveries, and that's on purpose, so you can have a super compensation later. But for the most part, you want to make sure you're supporting your or you're supporting your training with your nutrition appropriately, so your body's going to be able to get rid of that fatigue as fast as possible, so you can now express those higher levels of fitness. And then the other part, glutamine can maybe help a little bit with immune function. Uh, it's not really something that massively overdosing seems to increase performance. And then branched-chain amino acids, once again, do help a little bit with effectively that increasing the mTOR activation, but don't really seem to have a big efficacy on actually increasing performance. So that effectively is going to be our signaling pathways. Do you guys have any other questions, comments, concerns before we call it an evening? All right, guys. So thank you, Hannah, for doubling up on the fact that you have no questions. I really appreciate that. All right, guys, if you don't have any more questions, stay safe out there. Have yourself a great one. And I will see you guys next Thursday for our final lectures. And we're going to go ahead and have, hopefully, we're going to be able to interview another guest speaker before then. So you got another fun one to watch. Uh, if it works, that'll be great. A uh, friend of mine, um, if so, look, I'll hopefully have an announcement in the discussion board sometime soon so we can see if we're going to find a time to make that work. 
Otherwise, that'll be your final lectures plus a review. And then after that, just make sure you guys get your papers in and have yourselves a good uh, Thanksgiving, followed by good luck on the final. So come with your questions. Keep up the great work, guys. And have a great night.